Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Corey Webb, and I'm a marketing director here at Churn Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar titled The Leadership Leap from First Time Manager to Confident Leader. Before we get started, I do want to remind you that we are recording this session, and we will be sending out a link to the recording tomorrow afternoon via email. Um, throughout the presentation, I'd like to welcome you to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll address as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. And Ryan's been so gracious to offer, if we don't get to all of them in the webinar, he'll do a follow-up afterwards. So please submit your questions. We will try to get to all of them in one way or another. Um, and then also we have opened up chat for today's webinar. So please feel free to use that to um, engage and interact with one another and with us. Um, but we do ask that if you are submitting a question for Ryan to answer, that would be best to be put into the Q&A just so we can more easily track that. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker day. We have Ryan Johansson. Ryan runs a stress management and productivity training program, and he has a background in customer success leadership, which makes him the perfect person to be talking to us today about how to go from an overwhelmed imposter to a confident leader. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Yeah, thanks so much, Corey. I'm pumped to be here. Everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know if you're um, no matter what you're doing, taking an hour away from your day is difficult. So I appreciate that. And thank you for spending the time to invest in yourself. Not everyone does that. And just by doing that, you're putting yourself ahead of the pack. So give yourself a nice pat on the back. My name is Ryan Johansson. I'm based in the Boston area. This is going to be my third webinar with Turn Zero. So I'm excited to be here today. And like Corey said, we're going to try and make this one a little bit interactive. So I'm going to be coming to you, asking you to put stuff in the chat intermittently. So to get everyone warmed up. I just want to get a little pulse of where people are coming from. So um, this is obviously intended for people that are managers or hoping to be managers. So in the chat, can you let me know, are you hoping to become a manager or are you a manager now? And if so, how long have you been managing for? So just get used to that chat. Keep it warm. I'm going to come to you and keep asking questions. Thank you. People are coming. Two and a half years, manager, three years. Okay, so we got two weeks. Nice. Congrats. Um, Two weeks, 2.5 years. Hey, Lexi. It is going so fast, I can barely read. Okay, so it looks like we got a lot of managers on the line. Team lead, that's a really good one too. Um, this is gonna be really helpful for you. And if you're not a manager, none of this is intended to scare you away. We're gonna talk about uh, some of the challenges, but with the right learnings, you can avoid a lot of the mistakes that many first-time managers, including myself, make. Um, so let's get into it right now. Oh, sorry about that. So I'm going to share why I got into this and why this is important to me. But over the past few months, I set out to do this research project. And I actually released an ebook Monday called Stress in Tech, The First Time Manager Crisis. And one thing that I found was really wild is that 60% of managers fail within the first 24 months of taking the job. And I had a tremendously hard time. So I think this is something that almost all of us struggle with. So in this research project, I went out, I reached out to a ton of different tech leaders. And surprisingly, a lot of them that are perfect strangers said, yeah, I'm open to being interviewed on this. It's an important topic. I had a hard time with it too. And I asked them, what are the three biggest problems that face first-time managers? And from that research, I ended up getting nine problems, but they all fall into the same type of three themes. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And more importantly, we're going to reverse engineer those into giving you some stepping stones on how you can be a more confident leader. And the first of these is the mental transition. And what I mean by that is when you become a manager, you tend to get promoted because you're a really good IC. You're amazing at your job. Everything's going great. Not too much failure. And suddenly you're playing a brand new game. You deal with a bunch of failure and you're a beginner back at the beginning. And with that comes a lot of stress, comes with a lot of imposter syndrome. And if you're a perfectionist and work's really important to you, that can be a tough thing to go through. The second is the human element. So that thing like, how do I motivate people? How do I understand people that are way different than me? I was just met, I was just working with these people and they were on my team and now I'm supposed to lead them. And the last part is keeping up with your workload. You become a manager, your workload can explode, really difficult to keep on top of, and it can cause you to work insane hours. So in the chat, I'd love to know which one is the biggest struggle for you right now. We're going to talk about all three. 
yes, there's going to be a recording of the webinar. I just saw that. Workload, mental, workload, a lot of workload ones. Mental, workload, human element, human. One and two, that's fine. Uh, I, I struggle with all three at different times. So um, if you're all three, that's fine. You're, you're definitely in the right place. And the good thing is all of these are skills that you can learn, which I'm, I'm pumped that we'll show you a couple of things. So yeah, I'm glad that people are sharing more than one. And here's what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about how to build the right mindset to become an effective leader. We're gonna talk about how to 10X your interpersonal skills to motivate your team and get results. And we'll talk about practical strategy that you can use to focus on what's most important and make real progress toward your goals. And let's go to the chat um, and just say me if this resonates with you. And I'm gonna go through what my life was like and what I'm gonna guess your life might be like. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll give it a, you know, give an exclamation point if I'm really hitting any of this home. So you wake up and it is back to back to back meetings. It looks like someone threw up on your calendar every day. You might wake up on email and it's the very first thing you see. You have nonstop fires that you have to put out. Everyone's coming to you. Uh, I'm seeing a bunch of people agree with me. Uh, and it, it sucks. I don't mean to smile, but it's just like, I, I know your pain. Uh, you can't shut off. And then because of all that stuff, like you're dealing with nonstop problems, stress becomes your baseline emotion, which is when it starts to get even more challenging. And you have the constant imposter syndrome. Oh, I see a sad face for the putting out fires. Yep. Okay. So you're all, wait, that's not normal. <laughs> you're good, Sarah. Okay. And here's the worst part about that. Because of all that stuff, you're working hard. You're going through the day. And sometimes at the end of the day, you're just like, I feel like I work nonstop. Maybe I work 12 hours. I got nothing done, which is demoralizing. That sucks. Um, and here's the issue with that, too, is when you're working like crazy. You feel like you're not getting anywhere. And then you start, you're not spending time on what you want in life. Obviously, work is really important, but you don't want it taking over your life and getting in the way of things you enjoy. And that was my story. So. I'm happy to share more. So I don't mean to bum anyone out, especially like if you're thinking of becoming a manager, don't be afraid. Like it's a, it can be a really cool job if you handle it right, but there's a, there's a learning curve. And I want you all to know it's not your fault. It's not your fault. So let's go to the chat if anyone uh, can guess the city that this movie is from. Um, obviously it's one of my favorites, but I think it's really important to know that um, you're definitely not alone and it's a really hard job. And it's something that's really difficult. And it's not because you're not trying hard enough. It's not that you're not a good fit for the job or you're not able to do it or you're some type of imposter and you're never going to figure it out. Here's the real reason. It's a completely new job. So it's a struggle and it's really hard to get used to. And the other thing, which is insanely common, it's the number one reason that was quoted for people uh, in that study of how many people managers fail. They didn't get much help. Um, either from a lot of people get set up to fail. They don't get any training whatsoever. It's unfortunate. Um, Brooke, another Bostonian, love it. Uh, and then the other part is like, you need systems and frameworks. So like, you just need someone to like help you out and teach you how to do some of this stuff. Um, and that's why getting support is really helpful. And here's the cool thing. When you get that stuff right, you're able to handle the pressure and not take things home. And that's like I said, it's a skill you can learn. You start working with your team and getting results. And the other part, too, is you get results and you start to grow in your career, which is awesome. Uh, and you feel like, you, you know, that winning feeling. And God forbid you can have a life outside of work. So I want to tell you, because that's what happened to me. Um, and I went through a, a really tough road to get there. And when I was in, uh, I was working at a company, it was in 2018. And my CEO came up to me and he said, Ryan, you're doing a great job. We want to have you lead the team. And I was pumped. I wanted a manager job for years. I had a lot of good ideas. And so here's my mindset. I wonder if anyone went through as, as a naive experience as me. I said, I was thinking to myself, I was like, I'm going to knock this out of the park. I'm so good at this job. I know how to handle it. All I have to do is just teach these people exactly what I do. They're going to do it. And then we're going to be having a great time. They're all going to like me and think I'm, you know, amazing. And anyone want to guess the reality of what actually happened when I became a manager? We're going to go with the CS logo for sure. Um, it was insane. I was like, every day was a struggle. I felt like such a failure. I was having trouble relating with people. And it was really difficult. So it was a rude awakening for me. And like I talked about earlier in the mental part, like it was a shock to the psyche. Um, but like I smile about it now, but it was really, really difficult for me where 
I honestly put a lot of identity into my work and that's something I've obviously made some changes on, but um, I like from someone that really didn't fail much at work, like to go in through it all the time and have to deal with customers churning and not hitting goals. And it's despite working harder and harder and keep pushing, I started withdrawing from stuff that I like to do. I started working all the time. I was not doing things that I liked and I was a miserable person to be around and it wasn't fun. And then I hit the point where I'm dealing with like everything I just talked about before, like uh, that reason that resonates with everyone, the hamster uh, picture, because like that was my life and it sucked. And I was having a really difficult time. And then I felt trapped because I worked really hard for this job and I was finally like doing well in life on paper. I had everything going for me, but then I just felt so stuck because I was like, either I can keep working this job that I know is making me sick and that's not good for me long-term, or I can quit and I can live in a shack or try and build a, a cabin or something on the woods, but I'm not very handy. So I don't, I don't think that would have gone great either. But that feeling of being stuck was really tough for me. Um, so that leads to me having, you know, panic attacks all the time, um, you know, really going in, you know, to a bad spot. And I decide, okay, I've meditated before. That's pretty cool. I want, I like to go on vacation. So here's what I'm going to do. It was January 2018. And I had a few weeks to go. Our fiscal ended January 31st. And I said to myself, okay. Second week of February, I'm going to book a meditation retreat. I'm going to go away. I'm going to, you know, be in some beautiful jungle or something, meditate. I'm going to feel better and that's going to fix me. But that's not exactly what happened. Third week of January, I walk into my office and it was like my body completely took over. It was like nothing I've ever felt before. And I had this massive panic attack. And it was like someone told me everyone I'd ever loved had died. It was like the worst experience of it. One of the worst things that's ever happened to me. And uh, everything I've been holding in and like not talking to people about and not getting any help on just kind of exploded. I grabbed my boss and I told him what was going on and something really happened that was awesome. And he said, listen, take as much time as you need. And there's nothing more important than you getting better. And that's also a great management lesson. Like that person, I would do anything for him because he treated me like a human and was like very good to me. Um, and I like worked very hard to like make sure that I was always good to that person after, but that's an aside. Um, so I didn't know what the heck to do. That was a pretty miserable spot. Like no one gets into that situation in a good experience. So I called my therapist that I haven't talked to in months because I was so busy with work. And he said, well, maybe you can put yourself in a hospital. And I, I didn't know what the heck to do. I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, wasn't a great spot to be. Didn't feel very good about myself, but I just came to the conclusion that, hey, I ended up here and I want to try and make the best of this. I spent the weekend in there, but I had to go back to work. So I took about a week off of work and then I went back and I knew I had to make some big changes. And the good thing about that is that I wasn't independently wealthy. I had to go back to that. And I was radically open-minded that what I was doing wasn't working. So I figured I might try a couple of new things. And there were two things that I had to figure out was number one was the way that I thought about work. And number two was the way that I worked. Um, and I knew that more important than anything, the more people I talked to that I was having a really hard time with said they've gone through it before. So I had been feeling like I was all alone for a long time, which was really difficult. But what made me feel a little bit better about it was that I wasn't the only one. And the really good thing that I learned is other people have gotten through it too. So I could find out their experience of how what shortcuts to take, what to do or get advice. So I started actually getting help from other people. And that was one of the, if you can take one thing away is get support and get help from people because trying to do stuff on your own, it's really difficult. And I'd like to say life got perfect out of there. It was a linear climb, everything was smooth, but I've had a tons of ups and downs, but I'd like to say everything got better over time. And here's the cool thing, as bad as this was and all the mistakes that I talked about before and all these problems that happened, if you build the right skills, and you can reverse engineer those problems to avoid them or be able to handle them at best. And that was kind of what I found out that going the hard way, I have figured out how to become a confident leader. And it was a very painful path, but I'm, I'm happy to share a couple of things that I figured out along the way. And this is my, my belief is that you need all three of these things to be a confident leader. And it depends. You need to be good at managing yourself because everyone looks to you. You're suddenly in charge and the way you handle yourself and set the tones, incredibly important. You can't pass your stress onto your team all the time. The second is how you manage others. It's critical that you know how to relate to people, you can understand them and you work well as a part of a team. 
The third is how you manage your business. You have to make sure that you're getting outcomes and you need all three. So if you can handle yourself and others and people love you, but nothing gets done, you're not going to last in that job very long. You can take care of yourself and get good results. But if your team is miserable, then you're a monster and that's not going to work very well either. The other thing is if you take care of your team and your business, but you sacrifice yourself, you're not going to last very long either. So it's very important that you get all three dialed in and that's how you can make a difference. But here's the cool thing that I've experienced is by becoming that confident leader, I wasn't, I was accomplishing more and I ended up becoming a director shortly after and starting my own business and, and things really took off just by learning some skills. The other thing too, is I wasn't working as hard because I was able to give some things up. I learned how to delegate better, I learned how to trust my team and empower them to do things. And it started to be more fun. Once you get that human part right, you can enjoy yourself more, you get to learn more about your team and it becomes more enjoyable rather than being that boss telling people they're wrong and how to do things. So here's the path to get there. There's those three things that I talked about. We're gonna show you a skill for each one that you can walk away from today and be able to make a difference there. And the first is managing yourself. And this is, like I said, it's one of the most important parts. And here's some of the things that happen with like that I was at least struggling with too. And this is some of the things that came up in the research and other people that I've talked to is some of the frustrations that a first time manager goes through is just that you're stressed out all the time. And when you're in a period of stress, it's really hard to focus on what to do, come up with good ideas. You're having that imposter syndrome, and that can be really difficult because you're afraid of making the wrong choice. So you get paralyzed and you're not making decisions that you should be making. And then things can get even more difficult. And I think the number one mistake us new managers make is not asking for help. You suddenly think that you should have all the answers, but that's not how it works. And like I said before, if you can take one thing away, asking for help is that cheat code to get to that next level with a lot less mistakes. And the sad thing is all those things when bubbled up and you're not taking care of it, start asking yourself, is this right for me? And the goals there is just like, you wanna be able to reduce your stress and build some confidence and you wanna do your best work. And more important than anything, you just wanna know you're going in the right direction. Like it's, it's painful. There's a lot of challenges along the way, but like even just knowing that you're moving in the right direction and if those steps keep being taken, it's gonna work out. That can be a big help. So let's talk about stress. And this is one thing that it's inevitable. Management can be, can and is a stressful job. And I actually got a, a note from someone that I, I run stress tests before I do an engagement with any organization. And someone kind of snidely wrote like, well, working in tech is stressful. I'd love to hear how it isn't. And the thing is, it's obviously stressful, but it's just like climbing a mountain. If you climb a mountain barefoot, it's going to be terrible. But if you have the right equipment, the right skills, it becomes a lot easier to deal with, not as painful. And here's a skill I want to go through with you today, and we're going to practice it live. And I want you to keep an open mind. It might be a little bit different, and but just trust the process and you're going to notice a difference right away. So it's called box breathing, and it's used by the Navy SEALs. And it's a really helpful technique that is going to help you go from that, that stressed out state to that calm state. And I'm going to walk you through how it works. So we're not starting yet. These are the instructions. I'll let you know when we're going to start. So you're going to put all of your focus on your breath. It can be helpful if you just put your hand like on your chest and like follow your breath that way and just focus on the sensation of it. But all you do is you breathe in for four seconds. It can be helpful if you do it through your nose, but you don't have to do it that way. Then you hold it for four seconds. You breathe out for four seconds. And you can do that through your mouth. And then you hold out a uh, hold for four seconds. And then you repeat it like in that box motion. So it's four seconds every time. And we're gonna repeat this process for three minutes. I'm gonna keep count. There's literally all you have to do for the next three minutes is breathe. Um, if you're not used to ever meditating or taking time off, this three minutes might feel like three hours, but be patient. There's a good result at the end of it. So to get started, just take a regular breath in. Ready, go. And out. And we're gonna start, so breathe in. And as you can see, this timer now holds. And if you wanna shut your eyes, Oh, you can do that too. And I'll just count things through. Hold. In. Hold. Breathe out. Hold. Breathe in. Hold. Hold, 
Oh crap, my GIF broke. Sorry. Breathe out. Hold. Breathe in. Hold. 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 And now one more minute. Breathe out. Hold. In. Hold. Out. Hold. In. Hold. Out. Hold. Okay, now you can resume your normal breathing. Sorry, I jacked up the GIF on people. Um, sure, you'll still notice something. So in the chat, what did you notice? If you can describe even just in a few words, it'd be really helpful to hear what you noticed. Are people asleep? Heart rate slowed, quiet, calm, brain, si brain silence. I've never heard that one's really good. Relief, calm. Fidgety, that's okay too. Um, it's not, it's something that like with practice, this gets better. It, okay, you can notice where your stress is held in your body. So I want you to think about something. What would you do? Like, how helpful would it be to be in that state for a really difficult conversation or a salary negotiation or anything like that? So you're probably going to be a lot more resourceful. You can handle things. You can take more difficult conversations. So don't forget about this. And this is something that even if you practice it, it's something where you can do it on the fly. You can notice a difference in just a minute or two. So don't leave that behind. And here are some of the lessons about that is with stress, it clouds your judgment. You're in a fear state. It's really difficult to think through and you can make mistakes and sometimes act out. You can react emotionally. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, we say things that we might regret later, especially when we're working with people and stakes are high. So it's really important to take a step back, take a few breaths. And the important thing is if you think of peace treaties, those last days, months, years. You don't have to solve every conflict at that then and there. So take a step back if you have to. That can save you a lot of goodwill with your team. The other thing too is stress. You can pass it on to your team. If, if everyone's running around like that, it's not going to be good for anyone. And the good thing is it's a skill anyone can learn. I really struggle with this stuff and it's been a lifesaver for me. Now, let's talk about managing your team, which is that human element. It can, some people are naturals. Other people struggle with it. And everyone is on some type of a spectrum of on one side is people that are very human oriented. And then the other side is people that are very task oriented. So um, I, this was a shortcoming for me because I'm very task oriented. I like to focus, I'm an introvert and it's something that I had to learn. It, but it's the good thing is it's like I said, it's like everything else, you can learn it. But these are some of the common mistakes that a new manager might make. I was guilty of a few of them. And one of the major ones is overlooking the human part. So you're so excited. You have all these good ideas. You roll out all these new initiatives to your team, but you don't take the time to get to know them. And how do you think that makes them feel? They don't feel included and people might not be as willing to work with you over that. The other mistake that I was largely guilty of is trying to clone myself. I learned the hard way that not everyone is going to be wired the same way you are. Not everyone's going to be motivated in the same ways. So by taking the time to understand someone, you're going to get a lot further than thinking people think the way you do. 
And here's a newsflash. If everyone thinks the way you do, you're going to be have a lot of blind spots organizationally. So having those diverse thoughts, opinions, and ideas are actually going to help you a lot more. So get used to people disagreeing with you. It's actually really good feedback. Uh, and then the other thing too, which is a real killer for, you know, leads to most management problems is avoiding those tough conversations. And that can be whether it's giving feedback to an employee who might be struggling, but you don't want to hurt their feelings, or you're afraid of pushing back on an initiative that's going to hurt you and your team to your management. Um, and then some of the worst case scenario when you're dealing with this human part is you might think the dreaded thing of like, does my team hate me or not like me? Like, what am I getting wrong? Um, and here's what you want to try and work toward is you want a team that trusts you. You want to be able to motivate your team and build a good culture where everyone's winning and happy. And I know that this seems like really far out, but by doing the right things, it gets a little bit easier to do. And there's just a very simple rule you need to follow here when you're working with others. I learned this in an interesting way where I had a really tough time with an employee. We didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. It was causing a lot of conflict. And I'm a person who I like I care too much about work sometimes and I bring it home with me and it was starting to affect like I was having trouble sleeping over this situation. And finally, I called a friend and talked to him about it. And he was like, listen, he was like, don't seek to be understood, seek to understand. And this means you really want to get an idea of where that other person is coming from, because you're going to get a hundred times further with someone if you understand their point of view and ask them questions than if you just tell them what you want them to think. Where naturally, if someone is abrasive and not listening to you, naturally, you're not going to be as open-minded to their beliefs. So it's it's like a psychology 101 thing, but it makes a huge difference, just that small reframe. So let's go through a practice situation of what might happen is... This has probably happened to us before. We've probably all been that team member and that manager in the situation where you have a team member invite you to a quarterly review with a major customer and the meeting's a disaster. Let's say, you know, the, it ends up with the, the VP, your biggest company is saying, this is a giant waste of my time. You guys let me down. Um, I also chose this gift because I like ice cream and nothing sadder than seeing ice cream that has fallen. Um, but let's think of that situation. So what a, a rookie manager might do and if you react emotionally, instead of taking a breath and thinking things through and being calm, uh, you might go right into that discipline mode where you say, you really let us down, you need to be better about that, and you, you can't let that happen again. You kind of are justified in some degrees, it, like obviously you're upset, it's a big deal, the person made a mistake, um, but here's the thing, when someone already knows, that person probably is mightily aware that that went wrong, so kicking someone when they're down, when they're down is they're going to take their deflection from being mad at the situation to being mad at the you. And one of these things as a leader is if you're trying to build rapport with someone is letting having someone's back when you shouldn't have it will make it you a lot further. So the thing about that is like you can use this as a teaching moment to build a lot more trust with your team instead of just diving in on everything that went wrong. So there's a better way. And one of them is the Socratic method. So this is something that it's it's fairly simple. Uh, I'd love to see in the chat if anyone, I know that I'm like actually starting to get older now. So if anyone recognizes this movie, we'll be friends after this, let me know. Um, but the Socratic method is something that is really helpful. And all it is, is you're asking people questions to understand their point of view. And what works really well about this is it's gonna help you get to the root of problems. So. I'll be sending these slides after, so you're gonna get access to all this stuff too. Uh, and then you can think of like how to apply it in your own life, but here's how it might work in that scenario. So rather than diving into, you screwed up A, B, C, and D, you can just say, why do you think we got that feedback? And like, don't be a dick, just keep it in a neutral tone and, and like genuinely try and get their opinion. Then the other thing you could say is, well, if you had another shot, what do you think we could do differently? That helps them generate some different ideas on things they can do. And then another thing you can do is what are some ways we can avoid that in the future? So you already have them thinking, here's a better way to get to this next time. See how that simple change makes a real difference in kind of getting that idea into someone's head rather than telling someone that. And here's the benefits of using something like that. And I'll admit, this isn't going to work. You can't use this in every single situation, but it can be incredibly helpful. And there's a lot of things about consultative leadership, which makes a huge difference. But here's the thing. With the Socratic method, it helps you understand that other person's perspective. Like I mentioned earlier, not everyone is wired the same way you're wired. So other people might have a different view of the world. 
And then even more importantly than that is you get to the underlying cause of an issue. So if you just jump into assigning blame and telling them what they did wrong after you, with the armchair quarterback after a call goes wrong, you're not understanding what actually caused that. So it might come off that they're underprepared. But upon further review, maybe it's a thing where they don't understand what's really expected of them or they don't know how to handle an executive call and they might need a little more help on that. So it's really important to just identify that a little bit better. And the good thing is, it's why I use the picture of someone fishing. This is the ultimate give a fish instead of teach, uh, uh, teach someone to fish instead of giving someone a fish. And that's because by guiding someone to answer things for themselves, you're not going to have to go through that every single time. And this is something where it takes an investment up front, but A, you're going to build a better rapport and relationship with a person along the way. And B, you're going to empower them to figure things out for themselves. So they're not constantly asking you for things. Which, so like we talked about earlier, you're not having to work as hard and answer questions all the time. What are the lessons about that? Double down on the human element. It's something where maybe you're already killing it in that. And if you are, awesome. Um, it's something that a lot of people overlook and it's very important. And if you get it right, it makes a huge difference. Um, and then getting to know your team is really high leverage. And I don't just mean like, obviously you wanna understand, like it's good to know a little bit about them personally. You don't need to know their full story, but just the facts of like, hey, what kind of personality type do I think this person falls into? What are their strengths? What are their interests? Where are they trying to go? And you can use that stuff to tie back into motivating someone. So if you understand someone's looking to buy a new house or get married or start a family, you can link back to the things they do and how that matters. So it's incredibly important. And then I'd say understanding the person instead of telling them is gonna be really helpful. And let's talk quickly about managing your business. So by that, I don't mean like your, your own business. I just mean um, how to get results and like the way that you run your day. Because some of us, uh, myself included, when I was managing, I ha also had a few accounts that I had to deal with too. And like, that's a big struggle where you have a lot of stuff to do, but your team needs you to, you feel stretched in a million different directions. And here are some of the mistakes that I definitely made. And I hear, you know, from research and other people I've talked to, these are some of the things they bring up is one of the major ones is having like no game plan or system for how you run your day. That's a thing where, especially in CS, life can be chaos. So if you don't have anything going on or like ways to handle incoming requests, it'd be really difficult. So you need some type of operating system. It doesn't have to be mine. Uh, it doesn't have to be anyone else's, but at least something that helps you guide how, how you handle the day. The other thing too is a big mistake is not pushing back. So being afraid to have those sometimes challenging conversations about say you, your executive comes to you about wanting to work on a new thing, but your team is already stretched thin and working on multiple things. A, a really small thing I did with my CEO is if he came to me, he'd have ideas once in a while and say, well, that's, that's a great idea. And I think that would be a good use of, you know, I think that would be something we should look into, but we have X, Y, and Z going on. What should we deprioritize in order to do that? And I wasn't being a bad person. I wasn't being rude or anything, but it helps someone think, actually, I should have this other team focusing on instead. So even just taking that minute and being respectful can make a huge difference and learning how to do that gracefully. And the other mistake that a lot of managers do is you could work a hundred hour weeks and not get it all done. It's just, I, I think I used this on the last Turn Zero webinar too, but um, one of my favorite Seinfeld episodes is Jerry asks Newman, who's a mailman, why all the mailmen go crazy. He says, it's because the mail never stops coming. And same thing with CS, like your job, you know, you're never going to finish everything. You're never going to hit inbox zero. Um, so like you need to make sure that you do have some balance in your life because the result of all these things leads to burnout. And here's some of the things that you probably want right now. And um, that's like, like, this is exactly what I went through. It's like, you want your work to mean something. Like going back to that earlier example, you're going through a million things. It's really difficult. Uh, you want to get results and get to that next level and not work 80 hour weeks, which uh, if you don't put some systems in place, that could be your reality. And all because we want to be successful and have a life. Um, I don't know what that means specifically for you, but it's really important to have other stuff outside of work to look forward to. So I'm going to go to you in the chat real quick. And I'd love to know, how do you know what to focus on? Ryan, your movie and TV references are spot on. Can we be friends for sure? Awesome. Um, but yeah, let's eat your frog first. I love that. Like, how do other people know what to focus on? The big rocks, I like that. How are people doing this now? Like, say you have two things that are important. What, what do you pick first? What has most impact? Biggest difference. I don't get all the references, but they resonate. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, aligns with values, revenue. So there's all these different ways you can do it. And I talked about systems, and this is one that's really tried and true. I think I talked about this in the last one too, but uh, I swear by it. And this is the Eisenhower matrix. And you don't specifically have to use this, but I do recommend that you have some system that you figure out how to prioritize your tasks. Because as a leader, as a CSM, no matter what you are, no two things are created equal. But a good way to measure it that the Eisenhower matrix does is how important something is. Important means, is this going to drive revenue for the business? Is this going to help us hit our goals? The other thing is urgent. Like, does this is this due right now? Is this renewal tomorrow? So it kind of goes on those two matrices. But if you struggle with what's important, a really good way to figure it out is what will take you to that next level as a leader. I'm kind of giving away a few things here, but the more you can understand how what you do fits into the company's larger goals and how you can communicate to that your team of how those goals work together, the further you're going to go in your career. That, that's a, a very big secret that, um, so you want to always remember like, what are the things, the smaller things break down that I can make a bigger difference in? And say your goal is we want to get to a certain NRR amount. You're figuring out what are the things we do that makes the biggest difference there. So enough of my tirade there, but we'll go through like these four different options. So the first is something's important and urgent. That means those are the things that you want to do first. And you might say, well, Ryan, I have three things here. If you have a bunch of things in that bucket, what you're going to want to do is just say to yourself, what's most important and just trust your gut and just do that first. The next one, which is just as important is your, it's important, but it's not urgent. This could be like you have a report to do, or you are going to put together a slideshow for a new customer it has to get done, but you can schedule it. So you can look through your calendar and say, okay, I got some white space Thursday. I'm going to set it up then. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the one after that is to delegate things. And this is a struggle as a new manager where suddenly you're not in control of your destiny. This stresses out managers big time because other people are in charge of your success, which can be a really tough thing to deal with. But um, those things that are urgent, but it's not as important to you, like, you know, they do need to get done, but it's not going to make or break the business. That's something you can empower someone on your team to do. Or another way to kind of bring this into the 21st century a little bit is to automate it. And this is another thing as a leader that can make a really big win for people is if you notice what are the things my team's doing that takes up a lot of their time that doesn't add a ton of value and figure out ways to automate them. Really good example is if you're sending out any type of customer reports through something like Salesforce or HubSpot, usually you can automate that stuff and have it sent right away. So that can, if you're not doing that right now, look into it and that can be a huge time saver. Um, and then the last thing is the eliminated. So once in a while we get like cool opportunities, things pop up and it sounds kind of interesting, but like you should always look at through that lens of what I talked about before. Like, what are my most important things? Because you can't do everything. So like figure out those things that are going to make the difference for you. And then that's where you should spend most of your time. So I could talk about all this stuff, but I want to get used to doing it. So I encourage you, if you do um, grab a pen and a piece of paper, and we're, we're going to give like three minutes for this, just so you can get used to doing this, because it's really important. And what we're going to have you do is just draw that line. And I'm going to go back so you can see what it looks like, but just draw exactly those, you know, one line this way, one line this way, and write down those five things and then write it in what quadrant it should be doing. And then I'd also like you to think through, like, what's one thing you shouldn't be doing? And let me know in this chat, like, what's one thing you can probably either delete or delegate? So I'll give everyone two minutes and I want you to go through this exercise. So like I said, just write down a couple of things and figure out where they go in each box. And this will just get you used to doing it. And there's a follow-up I can share with you after. Yeah, sending out reports or schedules. That's that'll be a huge lift for you, Nicholas. I've noticed a big difference since doing stuff like that. Um, meeting organizers being in charge of their own follow-up emails. That's a really good one. Laura, your name was cut off in my window. Anyone else? What's one thing you can delete or get or um delegate? Or automate. Yeah, delegate Susie, that's a good one. Writing templates and playbooks.
Now, going back to that asking questions and understanding thing too, and helping your team get to the answers, if you empower your team to be able to write those templates, they'll figure out how to do it and they're empowered how to do it. And then that's one less thing. So um, this is going to be one of my takeaways, but like by investing that time up front of teaching someone how to do it, it saves you a lot of time in the back end. Yeah, providing information to other departments. Um, yeah, that's a, a CS thing too. Like everyone is always coming to you. You get um, every single department always wants something to do with customers. So um, that's a that's a challenge too. Yeah, it's all about like maximizing your time as a leader too. And it's not like, hey, I'm giving this work so I don't have to do it. It's, hey, you know, I think this will help you and this is something you want to focus on. So um, you can find a lot of wins there. Okay, so that's the two minutes. I hope that made a little bit of a difference Log writing task to my team. That's a good one, Andre. Okay. Now we got more coming in. Yeah, Megan, that's a really good one. Give more people access to information. And I'd say like one of the big wins for me is I had to do manual renewal forecast, which I'd have to go through a bunch of stuff. I spent a couple hours over a Saturday learning Power BI that connected to Salesforce. Then I had an automatic dashboard. Anyone could pull up at any time and it automatically refreshed and it saved me probably two hours a week. Um, so investing that smart time can make a huge difference, which brings me to some of my lessons. Um, you have to invest, but if you do systems, it's going to make a huge difference. And those things help you scale, especially a lot of us are asked to do more with less. We have small teams. We have a ton to do. Be really challenging. Uh, the other thing too is like, to protect your time. It's really important as a manager, you're going to have a ton of requests, just like as a CSM, but it's really important to make sure that you're scheduling time for what you need to do. And that's something I could spend a very long time on doing, but I'd encourage you to make sure that you're finding time in the day, even if you have to proactively block off an hour, a half hour during the day, just to get some of that stuff done, or, you know, in the morning, at night, whatever you're going to do, but make sure you're making that time for yourself. Okay. Uh, we're, we're coming close to the question and answer part, but um, let's put it all together real quick. So those are the top three things. Uh, we gave you a couple of things that you can get away with uh, or, or go away with, not get away with, but here's what I want you to remember is everyone deals with imposter syndrome and stress. It's almost universal. So it's, you're not alone, but you can build skills to manage it, which is great. The other thing is you get better results working with your team than by telling them what to do. The third is that you need to have systems that control the chaos. It makes a huge difference for you. So I'd love to hear in the chat real quickly, what was the number one takeaway that you had from today? Or what's one thing that you're going to start doing? And also, if you have questions, throw it in the Q&A part, and I can talk as many of those. Breathing. Yeah, Eisenhower Matrix, box breathing. Yeah, automating processes. That'll make a huge difference for you. Socratic method. I love that that one. I wish I heard about that way before. That's probably my number one thing where I talked about the human part was a little bit difficult for me sometimes. That would have made a huge difference for me. Eisenhower, sweet. Okay. Um, so I really appreciate everyone hopping on today. And I'm not sure why you came today, but you now know these three things that you do. You can build some skills to be able to handle some stuff like this. So you have two options. You can take what you learned today, start building things out, talk to other people, read some books, and build these skills on your own, which is going to help you. It'll make a huge difference, and it can be a little slow. The other option is you can plug into a system that teaches you the right skills in order how to get there fast. So I talked about how hard it was for me, and I don't want anyone to ever go through what I went through. So I created this program called the Leadership Launchpad. And what it does is think about it as part training group, part support group for new managers. That's going to help take you from an overwhelmed imposter to a confident leader in eight weeks. So it focuses on those three phases that we talked about, how to manage yourself, how to manage other people, and how to manage your business. And the great part about this is it's actionable skills that builds in the right sequential order to help get you where you want to go. The good thing is, I know you're really busy. It only takes about 75 to 90 minutes a week. There's one hour class that meets and you're not clicking through boring modules. Everything's live. You get peer support and you get feedback and accountability in real time. So you can become that a confident leader that we talked about earlier, where you accomplish more, you don't have to work as hard and you have more fun. 
So if anything, I hope you got a lot out of this, but if you do want to learn more and you want to find out how to get there a little bit quicker, I'd like you to book a call with me. Um, so uh, in this call, it's going to be about 15 minutes. And I just want to understand your biggest challenge. And if anything else, I can give you one actionable thing that you can learn. And it's going to ask you in the survey, if you do this QR code, what's your number one thing? If anything else, I'll share one thing with you. And if you book that call today, I'm going to throw in two extra things. The first is a stress reduction secret training for first-time managers. It's about 20-minute on-demand video that's going to give you actionable things in those two areas of stress and how to manage your negative thoughts. And the second is an Eisenhower matrix notion template that you can use to build your week out. It's also going to have a scheduling video of how I run my week too. So with that, let's go to the questions. I really appreciate everyone and yeah, book a call and we'll get that stuff for you. So thank you all for your time and I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, that was really great. Um, we do have questions that have already come in. So uh, and I invite everyone else to go ahead and, and submit your questions. Um, so let's see, we'll start at the top. Um, how do you manage your time when you when your work is divided with 70% regular CSM duties and 30% people management duties? Yeah, I think I had a similar blend too, actually, for a while. So like I say, going back to the calendar is going to be really important. So that made a huge difference for me to proactively schedule in those things ahead of time. Um, I would say another thing that might be really helpful for you is if you're spending time on development and trying to teach the team is figure out who's really good at what in your team and then have each of those people teach the rest of the team how to do what they do. So it shouldn't always be you running conversations. You should have them helping out too. That can make a huge difference. So like, make sure you lean on your team um, because they probably are more capable than you might think. I love that involving the team. Um, the next question is, how do you how do you navigate the Socratic method if your team member doesn't think their call went poorly? So I guess more broadly, if if you're if you're the person your employee doesn't think they did anything wrong, how would you go about kind of asking those questions? Yeah, that's difficult. So I think it's like you're you got to ask some questions to to guide them to that answer, which can be a little bit difficult. Um, and when you're having a difficult conversation, that's another thing too, with like anything feedback or that like someone's not noticing something is anytime you're having a tough conversation, you always want to start with the facts. So what act like, so with that, in my example of the customer said, this was a huge waste of my time. That's what I'd start out with because that that's something that happened. That's not anyone's interpretation of it. That's an actual thing. So like the more you can come in with like hard data or what's gone on, when it's not subjective, that's that's where you want to start and then work your way out to what's more subjective. I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question says, sometimes I find it challenging to delegate when my team is also very busy. How do you delegate to a busy team with a human first mindset? Yeah, I get that. And when you when everyone has a million things going on, the thing you might, the thing we all probably do a lot of, and I was guilty of that too, is like, trying to keep pushing through. Sometimes the best thing you can do is take a step back. That's why that Eisenhower matrix is really helpful. Um, and just if you write out, if you do an audit process of what's everything I'm doing, what's everything my team's doing? And this isn't a micromanagement thing. This is just understanding where the time goes, because especially if this is an exercise that will help your team not be frazzled and doing a bunch of things. And like that Eisenhower matrix, you can plug in each thing like, hey, I'm spending three hours here and no one even reads this report. I can probably get rid of this thing. So like I would start actually there and figuring out what are some of the things that we can either have another team help out with? What can we possibly get rid of? But then in the other part with delegation, it doesn't like, I think we have the, as new managers might think like, well, I don't want to, you know, hand work off to people and make them do it instead. Um, but as you learn someone's strengths, someone might really enjoy doing something that you might absolutely hate and vice versa. So like the more you understand like, hey, this person actually loves writing. So they're not going to mind doing blog posts. It's actually going to be one of their strengths and they're going to be actually happier at work if they do that. So I think with delegating, like figure out what someone's strengths are, what their ambitions are, and then it's not going to feel like work for them. I mean, it probably will, but like, it's not going to be as bad. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, something might be more of an opportunity as opposed to a burden yeah. if you're mm -hmm. delegating. Um, let's see, how do you approach time blocking your calendar? Feels like I'm always getting stuck being too granular or too general. How have you found a sweet spot? Yeah, so I would say some, like I made, 
one day I'll I'll post this on a blog or something. But my my worst example of this was in COVID. I had this schedule that I was going to follow, and it was like in fifteen minute color coded intervals that like I kept trying it every week, and I failed every single week because it was insane. Um, so I'd say like find something that is sustainable that you can start really slow on. So what I'd recommend is. I'm a big, like, I'll go off on tangents about like the idea of like deep work and focus time and like unplugging for an hour to focus on your important stuff. But if you can block off a half hour without email notifications, your phone to do what you have to do once a day or even three times a week, that's going to get you further in your career. Uh, like guarantee you, if you're going to, if you have what you need to do and you're executing on that, it's going to make a huge difference for you. So like start small, find something and just make sure you have like what you need to do at that time. Got it. I know calendars always, always yeah, a tough, tough one. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> and I'd say especially with customers. <laughs> yeah. And the other calendar thing that comes up too is like, and especially the CSMs, there's a lot of boundary setting that comes up with it too, because um, I like you should your calendar. Like I got into a heated debate with someone on this about like calendars being private versus public. Like I think it's mm -hmm. important to keep your calendar private. Um, that's just my feeling on it because it's not fair for other people to schedule over you for stuff. Um, so like if someone just books time over when you have something scheduled, it's just a conversation of, Hey, I can't, like, I have something going on and I can't move that. Like when else can we do this? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, how do you manage a lack of structure within your team when you're basically doing three jobs in one? Um, they said direction management and operations as being the kind of three things, um, and building out structure. Yeah. Any advice there? Yeah, that's that's tough. And I know a lot of people are in that boat of having to do a ton of stuff. Um, that comes, I'd say, I forget who had the question earlier, but taking that step back and figuring out like, what are the most important things? Because I had this conversation with a leader too of, and this is like a whole other thing that I cover, cover in the, the session too, of like how to have those tough conversations. But with that, like, you need to understand what am I doing that's actually going to be the most valuable for the company. And if you have engineers, they can only ship so much code. But what happens with a lot of companies that they just think CSMs will figure it out and they can do as much like there's a there's a hard gap in what we're able to do in a given day. So um, understanding like, OK, if if I could only do three of these things, which one should I focus on? Yeah. Um. Do you have any, uh, some examples of creative ways to motivate your team around a new goal? Um, yeah, I'd say the understanding them is really important, like knowing their why. I think as a team, I'm not, I've never been a fan of like the rah-rah motivation sessions. Um, I'm, I'm actually generally like, a, a, I'm a little monotone, but I'm actually like a very positive person, but I know that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. So I'd say if the harder it is, the more you need to do it on an individual level, because like I said, everyone's motivated in a different way. So tying in what their goals are personally, professionally, their why to that bigger picture of what the thing is, which isn't easy that like it's complicated. You got to mm -hmm. spend that time and capital figuring out someone who someone is, but that's a good way to do it. Um, and just the more you can tie that in, that's going to make a huge difference. It's just understanding the person. So it's not like a broken record with that. And I'm trying to think of what else would work. Um, I'm thinking of like kind of a, a funny one of like when you get that wrong, it really annoys your team. We <laughs> I know um, a friend who had a manager that like we were doing sales at a company and this guy was like, oh, whoever makes the most call gets a $10 scratch ticket. Like it, everyone uh, didn't like the guy after that. So like just be really careful with motivating. Like don't try those like gimmicks and stuff like that. Like um, people want to feel like they're winning. So find ways where you can make them win. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you seen success with player coaches? For example, a sales manager that also contributes to quota and revenue goals while leading their own team. I, I personally don't think it's a good idea. Mm. Yeah. You, you, you can only do, I think you can only do one really well. Um, I don't think it's fair to, I don't, I think it's most unfair to the person having to do two jobs. Um, I know that like some companies go through like a team lead process. I think, you know, if you're structured the right way, but like if you have both of those jobs, like it's, it's really difficult. And I think in sales too, it's a little conflict of interest there too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this question 
Let's see, let's see, we have. Um, what recommendations do you have when you were promoted from a team member to now their manager as the this relationship changes? Team member to manager. Um, I personally didn't go through that. I went through, I was like, I was a sales guy that went to CS and then became the leader of the CS team. But like, I was buddy with all the sales guys. So then they were working with my team. So like there was the awkward dynamics, but like, I'd say one thing that you got to start doing is you can't like take this or leave it. I, I mean, it's, it's up to you and we're all on zoom now, but like, you know, I stopped doing like the happy hours and stuff like that. And like the, you know, complaining about kind of all that stuff. So like creating a little bit of distance between some of that like stuff and you got to be I mean, that's, it's more responsibility. You got to be a little bit more of a grown up. So I'd say like kind of distancing yourself from some of that drama um, is an important step to take, but I'd say, I don't know what to tell you if you've just done it, but if you're going into that transition, it can be really helpful to show your leadership skills ahead of time. If you know, that's what you want to do is mm -hmm. start leading training, start being a leader on your team, even without the title. Then if you get promoted, it's a really natural progression. People aren't like shocked. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I like that. Um, as a new manager, how do you let leadership know about your successes without it seeming to be taking credit for your team's work? Oh, you, you talk about imposter syndrome stuff. Like I like felt, I felt like I was like getting away with something because like my team started doing really well. And like, I was getting like, I got really uncomfortable if anyone said anything like nice because it, like it's what they were doing. So I'd have like very, pointed conversations like, Hey, it's, you know, it's the team. It's not me, but, um, that's like your, I think that's another struggle of becoming a manager is like your new job is to get results through people. So if your team's doing a great job and executing, then your company should know that like you're doing a good job with that too. So, um, I'd say in your career, you, you need to proactively manage some stuff too. So like, you know, keep a record of, you know, the numbers before and after, make sure that you're documenting stuff along the way. But if your team is starting to fire on all cylinders, like it's, it looks good on you. Yeah. Um, let's see. This question says, how would you suggest providing this feedback and these learnings in managing up? I work primar primarily with the leadership team as my company, as an individual contributor, um, but I'm not a manager myself. I also am at least two decades younger than 98% of the, the leadership team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's a challenge to try and change a company culture. I don't know like what your company culture is. I'm, I'm hoping that they're like, you know, there's a reasonable amount of psychological safety there where they're a lot like some companies are good about letting you like say stuff and stand up which they should be because you're going to get better ideas you're going to have more engaged employees the research is insane on how important that is to provide at a company but i would say especially like anything else like assertive communication is something that you want to learn it's like anything else it's a skill uh it's something that i had to spend a lot of time on um my biggest thing was like not taking things as personally and being able to, you know, advocate and stand up and have those difficult conversations in a respectful tone, but that's a system, like there's great books on it. There's stuff you can learn, but I, you know, that's been one of the most important things in my career is to like master that skill because you're able to have like better conversations and without, you know, things getting emotional or personal or anything like that. That's great advice. Because it's intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for getting to know your team are, icebreaker games too cheesy or do you have any other suggestions no I don't um I don't hate that idea um I I think it's actually decent if you do it right um but I think one of the ones that we did was a lot of fun is another thing too is like like I said I wasn't as I'm not the most I'm self-aware of it but like I'm not the most people-oriented person so I had someone that was really good at like running fun stuff so I I let her do whatever the heck she wanted to do and she ran like awesome team events for us um, and she enjoyed it. And like, we all had a great time, but like some of the good ones were like, we did some zoom stuff, like playing virtual cards or stuff like that, or virtual games. And, uh, I'm competitive. So I really love that too. And we had a bunch of fun with that, but, um, anything that gets a team together, like it is really helpful. Someone in the chat said three truths and a lie. That's a good so. one. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. We're coming up at the end of our time here. So I want to just thank you for doing this webinar for us. I think this is our third year you've done a webinar for us in a row, and we really love to have you back. Um, so thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. I do want to remind you, we are sending out a link to the recording and a PDF of these slides. Um, tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. And at the end of this webinar, you'll see a survey pop up. Please take a minute to provide your feedback. Um, we'd love to get that from you as we continue to plan out our webinar programming. And uh, thanks again for joining us. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye.